Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp, and I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can jump in as well, thechadshow.com, or you can dial up 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD, and you are in, and you can tell everybody what you think, and, you know, maybe some people will actually listen to you. I mean, (laughs) unless you're talking to a bunch of Democrats and they don't want to hear what you have to say anyway, so they'll just shut you down. I mean, that just seems to be what they've been trying to do lately, and... We'll see how that works out for them in this upcoming election that is getting closer and closer every day. Lots to talk about today. I got good news and I got bad news for you, right? So are you a good news first or a bad news first kind of person? I'm a bad news first kind of person. So here's some of the bad news. The bad news is wages are still stagnant. Now, the Democrats are trying to say that wages are stagnant because of President Trump's reckless policies. We'll get to that in a minute. But wages have been stagnant for a few decades now. And there are multiple theories as to why that is the case, and we can go over those as we go. So that's part of the bad news. The other part of the bad news is it looks like we may be starting a trade war. President Trump going into more tariffs on Chinese products. They, of course, immediately hit back, putting more tariffs on American products. And the question is, how far will they go? I don't like a trade war. I am a free trade kind of guy, except... I think it needs to be free, fair trade. And there's no doubt that we are not having fair trade with China. But I don't think it's about a trade deficit. President Trump likes to talk about, well, uh, we got a horrible trade deficit with China. They're making so much money off it. Well, we consume as a nation more than we produce as a nation. So it doesn't matter whether it's a trade deficit with China or some other country. We're going to have a trade deficit because we consume more than we produce. Now, the only way you're going to change that is to produce more than you consume. And that's not going to be done with a tariff trade war, I don't think. And 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 unfortunately, these things can go south really quickly. And most economists will tell you that tariffs are what led to the Great Depression. Now, can you use it technically and tactically in order to put pressure on on certain countries, yes, you can, but I, I, you have to be extremely careful on how you do it. And here's the other question I have for you. Whether you agree with this or not, should one man be able to do this? President Trump is doing it by claiming it's national security. It really should be done by Congress. I don't care whether it's President Obama, President Trump, President Bush, President Clinton. One man should not be able to do this. And Congress neither Democrats nor Republicans really want to be on the hook to vote on this. They'd rather be able to blame Trump if it goes badly. I hope it doesn't. So that's my negative on this. But, okay, here's the positive on it. For the month of June, 213,000 new jobs. In fact, over the last few months, they've adjusted up, as they've been able to look as the months have gone by, that more jobs were created than they thought. And the three-month average is right around 211, 213,000 jobs. It's not smoking hot, but it's a lot better than it's been. Manufacturing, how about an extra 36,000 jobs? How about the Hispanic unemployment rate falling to its lowest level? Black unemployment ticking up just a tiny bit. Unemployment overall ticking up from 3.8% to 4%. But they say it's because more people are looking for work. See, You're only counted as unemployed as if you're actually looking for work and can't find a job. If you just give up looking, you're not counted anymore, which is why we can't really trust what the unemployment numbers have been for the last few years because people have been giving up looking for work. You have to look at the you have to look at the participation rate in the workforce. And that's been unfortunately very low during the Great Recession. And it's been slowly ticking back up. And as that participation rate goes back up, even though more people are working, If more people are looking for jobs, you can have the unemployment rate go up even though more people are working. It happens all the time. So we'll keep an eye on that. But with everything going on with President Trump and the tariffs on China and China responding, you're thinking, okay, how bad are the markets going to look today? Dow Jones, up 99 points, 99.74 to be precise, 0.41%. All right, well, how about S&P 500? Up 23.21 points, up 8.85%. Uh, 
NASDAQ, up 101.96. That's 1.34%. So they're all up. Why are they all up? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, shouldn't they be down if people are worried about the tariff? And the... Well, here's what CNBC says about it. Stocks are rising as Wall Street cheers the jobs report, shrugging off the trade fears. And, well, they're saying you look at 213,000 jobs in June. You look at the rolling averages I mentioned around 200,000, 211,000 over the last three months. And they only expected about 195 that, hey, you know what? Don't worry about the trade war right now. Okay, how long will that last? We don't know. But there is some momentum going on. Wages still lag. But over the last 12 months, 2.4 million new jobs. That's not too bad. Annual wage growth remains slower than what would be expected, though, if we were in, quote, full employment. And that's what I talked about yesterday. If you were able to hear the show yesterday, we were talking about this idea that uh, these, these employers in America, they just can't find enough workers. Like, what are you talking about? I mean, these numbers today show that that's not true. There are plenty of workers in America, but are they working for the right wage? If you look, if you're in the market for a job today, how many jobs would be ready to pay you the amount that you think you're worth or the amount that you are willing to work for? Everybody has that number in their head, you know, until they get desperate. But when you first get laid off and you're looking for jobs, Let's say you're used to making 30 bucks an hour. When you first get laid off and you've got, you know, maybe you got a month's worth of severance, are you immediately going to take a $10 an hour job? Oh, heck no. You've got in your mind, I got to get at least a $30 an hour job. That's what I've been doing. And so you're looking for that. And now eventually, if, if it goes long enough and you're not making enough money and your family's suffering and you can't make the bills, you're going to take a job that's, as you see it, beneath you. Even though you used to make thirty grand, thirty thirty dollars an hour, excuse me, now you're going to make twenty eight or twenty five or even twenty or eventually maybe fifteen. You, you'll take it, but you're not going to take it right away. And so, for some people, they even get to the point where it's not worth me to take a job at all unless I can make a certain amount of money. So, are we really at the so-called full employment, and is it really a situation where they can't find enough workers, or is it they're not paying enough in wages? I think. I think it's the latter. I just don't think that it's gotten to the point where the job market is tight enough that they're boosting the wages. Now, here's some more good news. The Labor Department Bureau of Labor Statistics, 155.5 million employed in June. That's the 10th record for President Trump on this. And the lowest Hispanic unemployment rate in a very long time. With all this going on, what are the Democrats saying? Well, I'm glad you asked. Listen to this. This is me. Okay, so you check your own checkbook portfolio. You check whether you're working or not. You check how you're feeling compared to almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, when President Trump won. Are you feeling that the economy is doing better than it was during President Obama or not? You look at the tax cut and looks what, look at what's starting to be able to stay in your pocket now compared to before. Do you feel like the economy is better for you personally? The DNC doesn't. DNC, the Democratic National Committee, the chair, Secretary Tom Perez, uh, uh, with low wage growth, um, wages have been stalled for two to three decades. Uh, they were The wage growth was slower during the Obama years, but that doesn't matter. With slow wage growth, rising health care premiums, um, do you think Obamacare had anything to do with that? No! And skyrocketing gas prices, it is true, gas prices are going up, and they go up every summer, and you look at what's been going on with OPEC, and you know there's only so much a president can do about this. I said this when President Obama was office. I said there's only so much President Obama can do about the gas prices. The problem is everything he's doing makes it worse, because he was trying to stop drilling on federal lands. All of the increase we've had in drilling from the Obama years on has been on state lands and private lands. And the fracking that has gone on has made us the world's number one oil producer and number one natural gas producer. Did you know we just just this year we became that? That's amazing. Natural gas was for a couple of years, but oil, this was the very first year. I just saw that like last month or two months ago. It's amazing. 
So anyway, back to the DNC. With slow wage growth, rising health care premiums, skyrocketing gas prices across the country, Donald Trump's reckless policies are hurting millions of hardworking families. Now, we just saw 2.4 million jobs, new jobs in the last, uh, what was it, 12 months, and 213,000 this month, and record low unemployment for Hispanics, near record low unemployment for blacks, and... The DNC is trying to convince you that these reckless policies are hurting millions of working families. They're so determined to undermine workers. They've held they held a Supreme Court seat hostage for nearly a year. Okay, it was near the end of Obama's run. It was a conservative justice who had passed. And why not allow the next president to pick since Obama had already picked? And now they're saying, well, then they should do it here, too. Well, that was a presidential year, not a midterm year. And Obama picked during a midterm year, and nobody said a word. So, I mean, all these things are just nonsense. And he's talking about this disgraceful decision in the Janus case. Listen to this at the end. Nominate an aggressively anti-union justice who became the deciding vote in last week's disgraceful decision in the Janus case. Now, if you haven't been following that very closely, the Janus case was simply about this. If you're working somewhere and you don't want to be in the union, shouldn't you have a choice to not be in the union? Say, I want to work here, but I don't want to be part of the union. Well, okay, you don't have to be part of the union, but you still have to pay the dues. Well, wait a second. I'm not part of the union. I pay part of the dues. Yeah, you have to. Why? Because you're getting all the bargaining that we get done for you. But I can bargain for myself. Nope, not allowed to. Why? Because that's just what we do. So you're making me pay your union dues, even though I don't want to be part of your union? Yeah, you got it. And some of those union dues are being used to promote political candidates and political ideas I don't like. Yeah. So the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. And that's somehow undermining workers. No, that's supporting workers who don't want to pay those dues. Let me tell you something. If Obama or Hillary Clinton had these kinds of numbers and this kind of an economy, the Democrats would be telling you how great they were. Instead, they say this. Trump and Republicans in Congress are trying to build a winner-take-all economy that enriches their wealthy friends and saddles working families with the bills. Really? Ask the people that got bonuses because of the tax cut. Ask the people that now have jobs that didn't have jobs six months ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Really? Because if you had these numbers with Obama or Hillary in office, you would be telling us how great it was. This is why people are so sick of politics. 844 Dig Chad to get you on board the program. 844 Dig Chad, and you are in. I want to get you the story uh, after we hit a little bit more on these Chinese tariffs about what's going on with those soccer kids in Thailand stuck in the cave because unfortunately one of the rescue divers has now died trying to help them. What happens next? We'll get all that coming up. My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. is worth 140 on Twitter, so tweet your beak off at Chad Benson Show Twitter. And if instant gratification is your thing, hit Chad up on Instagram at Chad Benson. Your bird will thank you. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can go right online to chat thechadshow.com, thechadshow.com. And you'll see all those links to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You just click on those and you're right in. You can also call 844-DIG-CHAT, 844-DIG-CHAT, and you're part of it. We were talking about the good and the bad news in the economy. And, yeah, I'm a little worried about the tariffs. I don't like it. Reuters reporting, Trump confirming, collecting tariff on $34 billion in Chinese goods. That started today. Could go all the way up to collecting tariffs on goods of $500 billion. Of course, Beijing says we'll respond, and they already are putting their tariffs on everything that they want to put tariffs on. Chinese Commerce Ministry spokesman Gao Feng said that the proposed U.S. tariffs will hit many American and foreign companies operating in China, disrupt their supplies, components, assembly work, said it's really declaring opening fire of a trade war on the entire world, including itself. Now, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officials due to collect 25% duties on a range of products, including motor vehicles, computer disk drives, parts of pumps, valves, printers. This is all according to Reuters. List showing uh, 
China threatening to respond with tariffs on hundreds of U.S. goods. Soybeans, sorghum, cotton, whiskey, uh, more on and on and on. And and a lot of the reporting on this today says this is going to hurt red state America much more than blue state America. And it will. It will for a while, depending on how it goes. Is Trump using it as a bargaining technique? Is this going to escalate into something even worse? Now, also, according to Reuters, some major Chinese ports were delaying clearing goods from the United States on Friday because of these tariffs and expecting other tariffs to come back and forth. Wine merchant in Shanghai said customs brokers were slowing the clearance process because of confusion about how and when to implement the duty. Said they're holding everything because there's uncertainty. And that brings us to this idea of what do you use the tariffs for? Martin Feldstein has a nice piece today, the Wall Street Journal. He's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Reagan, was, excuse me, Professor Harvard now. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm a free trade guy, but sometimes tariffs can be used. The thing is, what are you going to use them for and how bad is it going to get? What exactly is President Trump wanting from the Chinese government before he drops the tariffs? He said pressure China to reduce the trade surplus, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to be hard to do because we we consume more than we produce. So that's probably not really what you're looking for here. But what about stopping China from stealing the intellectual property of United States companies? See, to me, here's fair trade. You don't put any tariffs on us. We won't put any tariffs on you. Then there's one more part of it. You quit subsidizing these goods that you're sending to our country, and we'll stop subsidizing goods we're sending to your country. But then you have to do it because we subsidize our farmers quite a bit. China subsidizes some of the companies making some of the things they ship, but we also subsidize our farmers and we ship that stuff all around the world. So we also have to look at what we're doing. If you really want the fair trade, then we've got to look at every angle of this. And that's supposed to be what the World Trade Organization does. The problem is there's no enforcement mechanism here that seems to work here's case in point when you actually go to do work in china you have to agree to have a chinese partner and you have to agree to share your technology with china and then they steal your technology and it's not just us that's upset about this i'll give you the details and then the cave situation in a second my name's greg knapp in for chat on the chad benson show Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp in for Chad. How you doing? How you doing? You getting ready for a big weekend? I hope so. And we're talking just a bit here about the tariff war, the trade war that's starting because, hey, this is this is the first day. And President Trump is getting serious about what he's doing with China here with thirty four billion dollars that he's putting tariffs on upwards of five hundred billion dollars that he's saying he's going to be putting tariffs on. And China saying, oh, yeah, we'll do it right back. So where does it go from here? And as Martin Feldstein in the Wall Street Journal was saying, what what is the hope that China is going to do so you can say, all right, we'll take it off now? Is it that they will take off their tariffs? Is it that they're going to change the trade deficit? But we consume more than we produce, so that's probably not going to happen. But what about going after them stealing intellectual property? And as, and as I mentioned here, if you want to do work in China and you're a U.S. firm, You have to agree to form a partnership with a Chinese counterpart and share your technology with them. And then they steal it and use it to compete with you around the world. This is what they're doing all the time. And it's not just America that's claiming this. Europe's claiming this, too. And by the way, that's a violation of the World Trade Organization rules. And China agreed to those rules. China says, well, well. But the thing is, see, we're not violating the World Trade Organization rules on this because these American companies and European companies, they're voluntarily agreeing to work with a Chinese partner. Well, because otherwise you don't let them work there. That's not voluntary. Are you kidding me? 
So we filed a complaint with the World Trade Organization in March. The European Union filed a similar complaint in June. And you can hold your breath and nothing's going to happen. And that's the problem. There's no real enforcement of the World Trade Organization and the people who agreed to be with it when they violate it. So what are you going to do? So a negotiation with the Chinese under the threat of U.S. tariffs could be an effective means of changing China's policy on this. However, China could also push tariffs back and say, screw you. But if you say to them, listen, we're willing to take these punitive tariffs away if you stop stealing technology and forcing these businesses to partner with the Chinese business, maybe that would do something. This isn't a new thing. This has been going on for a long time. This has been going on for years and years. So these are the kind of things that maybe, maybe Trump could push for. I just haven't heard. Has anybody heard what he said? X, Y, Z. If China does X, Y, Z, we'll stop this. And then CNN has this story out. And and obviously CNN is not a big supporter of Trump. <laughs> I mean, I know that's, thank you, Captain Obvious, right? I get it. But it is interesting. Here's a problem I have with Trump. When Trump is saying, buy American, buy American, he gets mad at Harley Davidson. They're going to start making some uh, motorbikes overseas to avoid the tariffs. And then you get this story from CNN. President Donald Trump's resort, Mar-a-Lago, South Florida, filing a request to the Department of Labor for 61 additional visas for foreign servers and cooks. 61 H-2B visas. Now, These visas are supposed to be for temporary, non-agricultural workers. And here's how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to only be able to get these if you can prove that there are not enough U.S. workers who are able, willing, and qualified and available to do the work. 40 of the visas were for servers, 21 were for cooks. You're telling me in South Florida you can't find 40 people who want to be waitstaff and 21 people who want to be cooks at the Mar-a-Lago Resort? Well, you see, but it's only from uh, it's only uh, October to May. So, you know, it's hard to get these part time workers. It's virtually impossible. The president has said. Do you believe that? Now, the latest request says the wages would be twelve dollars and sixty eight cents per hour for the servers. Thirteen dollars and thirty one cents an hour for the cooks. And the other thing about these visas, the way these visas are set up. The only place you can work if you come to this country on this visa is for that employer that sponsored the visa. So once you get here, you're essentially, if you want to stay in this country and work, you have to work for that employer. It's a pretty good deal for the employer. Because what I think is really happening is they're underpaying. They're claiming there just are no Americans who will do this job. Well, maybe not for those wages that you're offering. So you can offer lower wages and then have somebody who has to stay working for you no matter how you treat them or they have to leave. And that's what's going on in Mar-a-Lago. And, and I think it's wrong. And I, and I think it, it's, it's hypocritical of Trump. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. The other big story that's been percolating out here, and it, it unfortunately doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon, is what's going on with these 12 boys and their soccer coach in Thailand. If you haven't been keeping up with this, the team decided that they were going to go spelunking. You know, they were going to go on this in, in this cave, very famous cave in Thailand. And in fact, there were news reports today that some of the boys' classmates have been talking to the press, and they've said, you know, our parents tell us to never go in that cave, especially during monsoon season. And the reason is it's extremely dangerous. So the boys and the soccer coach go into the cave. It starts to rain really hard, flash floods. They run further into the cave to avoid the floods, and now they're way in there. And they're in through, uh, it goes up and down, the trail goes up and down to the point that there are several areas where there is so much water that you would have to swim out. So there's zero zero visibility in these areas with water and in the the cave. There's no visibility at all, okay? They've been in there for a long time now. And they went nine days at first without food before they were finally able to get some of this stuff into them. And so they're weak. Oxygen levels are only at 15%. So they've been trying to get oxygen into them. It takes five to six hours for professional divers to dive through one area of water and then walk a little bit and then dive through another area of water and then walk through a little bit and then finally dive through the third area of water and come up to the team and the coach. 
five hours for professional divers. They brought in the uh, Thailand Navy SEALs. And one of the SEALs that went in there to bring oxygen to the children and the coach, on his way back out, he died. Horrible. Former Thai Navy diver, just delivered supplies and oxygen to the 12 boys in the coach. Lost consciousness on his way out of the cave and could not be revived. One of the officials said his job was to deliver oxygen. He did not have enough on his way back. Wow. So what do you do? How are you going to get these people out? It's, it's really kind of weird, isn't it? With the technology that we have, how are we not getting these, these kids and their coach out? The Navy divers can get to them, but they can't bring the kids out? Well, here's the thing. They were saying, why don't we give them diving suits, including the full head gear, not just a mask like you would have if you dive in the Bahamas, not just a mask and a regulator, but the whole full mask thing like they used to use in the old suits where somebody was up on the boat pumping the oxygen down to you, pretty much like a spacesuit, like you'd wear if you were going to the moon. So you don't have to know anything about diving, really. We're going to put you in this suit. We're going to put the full headgear on. You just hold on to me, and I'm going to swim you out of here. Just stay calm and don't panic, and we'll be all right. But for five hours, they're worried that the kids aren't strong enough, that they will panic, that it's extremely difficult for the professional divers to do alone, let alone trying to tow somebody i'm wondering when the diver goes through there can he just put a rope through there so that the person can just pull themselves along the rope as they're instead of swimming and then they don't even have to worry about the zero visibility there's got to be a way right well cnn did a big report on this when they said there's 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 problems more rain is forecast this weekend the rock is extremely porous rock and so whenever the rain comes the, the the water comes from all angles and slowly swells up these pools of water so they're trying to pump the water out. We still don't really know, do they have big pumps, small pumps? Is it working all the time? But they're afraid that they can't pump it out as fast as the water comes in, especially if they have more rain. And very soon they're going to be having rain every day during monsoon season here. So what do you do? Well, they said there's three main options. One, bring the boys out of the cave before the rains come. Maybe with that full face oxygen mask and dr- diving them out. But man, that's tough. Another one. How about try another way to reach them? Can you get there from above? Can you drill down into it? Are there openings? Are there natural chimneys they can use? Is, is there a way we can pull them out? Third one, wait until the flood water subside after the monsoon season. Are you kidding? That's October. Are you kidding? I can't believe that you can leave the kids in that long. They've got more than 100 Navy SEALs right now at the site. But... As I mentioned, five hours to swim through there. So how are you going to do this? Their physical strength, their lung function, their mental health, all very questionable right now. And they're worried that these kids could panic. Now, Neil Bennett is the managing director and an instructor at New Zealand Diving. And he says the coming rain could undo all the work that's been done to drain the tunnels in the last few days. He said the mountain works like a bathtub holding the water. And the cave system below is effectively the escape route for that water. So as soon as the rain builds up in some parts of the mountain system, the water level rises in the caves. And the rain's coming. Oxygen levels are around 15%. Anything below that, you're really looking at impairing even brain function. So they're saying, we can't wait. we got to get something done here. Well, to the rescue, Elon Musk? What? Really? Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk... He was talking about this on Twitter. Somebody tweeted at him, hey, is there anything you guys can do about it? And he said, well, maybe. He's got this company called Boring. And the Boring Company has advanced ground-penetrating radar, and he says it's pretty good at digging holes. So he said we could also drop ship some fully charged power packs and pumps to pump out the water. But he said, I don't really know how bad it is or what we could do until I have somebody on the ground there. Because when somebody asked him, can you help? He said, well, I suspect the Thai government has this under control, but I'm happy to help if there's a way to do so. Okay, I don't think the Thai government has it under control. Because this is what I'm talking about. With, with everything that we've got going on in the world, and everybody's paying attention to this now, we, we have 12 kids and an adult stuck in this cave, and we know exactly where they are, and we can't get them out. 
With all the technology and engineering and know-how and money that we have, we can't save these people? Uh, is the Thai government asking for help? I mean, engineers, oil rig guys, drillers, uh, repellers. Well, they are now saying that they will gladly take any help from Elon Musk. Said that he is sending his team to Thailand tomorrow to help in the cave rescue. And he may provide services for location tracking, water pumping, or battery power. Maybe even for drilling. And here's another idea he came up with. Well, he said, how about this? Maybe worth trying. Insert a one meter diameter nylon tube or shorter set of tubes for the most difficult sections and inflate them with air. You know, like you would with a bounce house at a kid's party. And then you walk through those instead of swimming through the water. That's pretty cool. So we got to start thinking like this. We got to start thinking of a different way. Because it doesn't look like the diving is going to make it there. So what he's essentially saying is, why don't we create a walkable pathway through the water? And one of the ways to do that, inflate this thing like a bouncy house and have you just bounce your way through it. That sounds pretty cool. It's worth a try. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD, you got an idea on how to save these kids? I think I think they'll take any suggestions right about now. Oh, I've got an update for you. On the 30-year-old man who snatched the Make America Great Again hat off the head of a 16-year-old and cussed him out and threw a drink on him at the Whataburger in Texas. All the details on it in just a second. 844-DIG-CHAD, my name's Greg Knapp. I'm filling in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. your social media addiction in for a healthier vice. No 12-step program needed for this habit. Yeah! <laughs> I like it. The Chat Benson Show. And my name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. And you're in. Yesterday I told you about the Make America Great Again hat theft. And, of course, it was the video that went viral. And the 30-year-old dude at the Whataburger, he walks in, and he rips the hat off the kid, and he throws a drink in the kid's face. You ain't supporting S N. And then he says, I'm taking this hat and putting it in my fireplace. B. And... The kid's like, all right, man, knock yourself out. And so now we find out the guy's name. We find that out yesterday. Now we find out that he's been arrested. Yesterday we learned that 30-year-old Kino Jimenez had been fired from his part-time bartending job because people figured out who he was. Now he has been arrested and he was released on bond for $5,000 the same day. He even talked to a local San Antonio news crew, and he said to them, you know, uh, this, this, this is out of character for me. But for those people that tried to say yesterday that the kids had started this, that they had, they had said racial slurs to him, and there were some anonymous reports on that going around yesterday, not according to Jimenez. He says that he, they were talking, and the kids, he asked them, why were you wearing that hat? The teen responded that he was supporting the president. Now, Jimenez told the news crew off camera that when he saw that hat, he didn't just see red. He saw the KKK, and that's what got him so upset. And this is what I was telling you yesterday. See, if it's just President Trump's policies that you're talking about, well, then we can debate that, and you like him and I don't, just like any other president. But no, we've got to get it. I'm talking for the left now. We've got to make you believe he's Hitler. He's a racist. He's a xenophobe. He's a transphobe. He's a homophobe. He is going to take away every right you've ever wanted. He wants to treat people as less than human. He So let's twist his words. So when he talks about MS-13 gangbangers who rape and kill innocent children, oh, he was talking about all immigrants are monsters. Uh, he, he wants to separate families. He So when you think that then it's okay to rip this guy's hat off. See, if, 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 if you think that they're basically the KKK, then wouldn't that be okay? And so he rips the hat off, and he rips the kid's hair, and he throws a drink in his face. So at least, hey, maybe people are starting to realize 
this isn't the way a grown man should behave with a 16-year-old teenager. So he's lost his job. He was arrested. And even the Green Party in Texas won't have him. Gavino Zarate, secretary of the Harris County Green Party, said this. We all have different opinions of our president, but we don't take it out on innocent kids who just happen to have a hat on. You may not like the hat, or you may not like the president, but you don't show that kind of aggression toward teenagers. It goes against everything the Green Party stands for. We are not violent. We do not take our aggression out on innocent young people. We are handling it in-house. From our point of view, he is banned from being part of our organization. End quote. Good for them. But there were many people on the left tweeting out laughter about this, including uh, Lamont Hill, CNN contributor, also a professor, with his crying, laughing faces. And he's saying, you know, hey, I'm not saying you should do this to a teenager, but when you support a racist president, then I'm not going to be very sorry about it. I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the tweet right in front of me. On the positive side, side of this, excuse me, Donald Trump Jr., promising to replace 16-year-old Hunter Richards' hat with one signed by the president. wonder if he'll be wearing that one. Do you think he'll ever wear that hat in public again? Because that's the point, is to bully you into not doing that. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. 844-DIG-CHAD, you're in. 844-DIG-CHAD. Also, thechadshow.com online. There you find all of the social media links, and you can be a part of that as well. I've got some questions for you today on you and your children. And I want to start with you imagining that you have a kindergartner. I've got two daughters. Now, almost 19 and 16. And when our youngest was in kindergarten, she had a horrible kindergarten teacher. I mean, it was it was just the classroom was totally out of control. One day, my kid got hit in the head with a block. Um, m- my wife is a teacher. She was able to see what was going on. And we, we got our kid out of the classroom. And when we transferred our daughter out of that classroom, about five other kids transferred out of the classroom. It was like. Just one had to go before everybody was like, yeah, me too. I'm getting my kid out of here. So there are bad teachers. Most of them are good teachers, but just like with anything, there are great teachers, there are good teachers, and there are bad teachers. There are great lawyers, believe it or not. There are good lawyers, and there are horrible lawyers, right? There are great police officers, good police officers, and horrible police officers. On and on we go. So there are some bad teachers. When do you decide it's time to get your kid out of the class? Well, here's what happened in Miami. Two weeks into the school year, Candy Escato noticed that her five-year-old son wasn't doing well. He cried every morning before he went to school. Now, this happens to some kindergartners. They're not used to leaving home. Maybe they weren't in any kind of a daycare, nursery care, outside care at all, and they're just tired of going to kindergarten. It happens, and they get used to it. But it wasn't getting better. Grades were poor. His behavior even at home had changed. And while they were doing their homework together one day, the little boy told his mom that he was a bad boy. And she she said to him, why would you say something like that? And according to the Miami Herald, he said to her, that's what the teacher tells me when I don't do my work. So Mrs. Scotto took her concerns to the elementary school principal. The principal told the mother, hey, you need proof of your accusations against this teacher. This teacher, by the way, is teacher of the year for the school. So... She decided she would get some proof. So the mother bought an audio recorder and put it in her son's backpack and turned it on for four days. Now, according to lawyers, a public school 
classroom is a public space. So the party being recorded does not have to provide consent to be recorded. So she has 32 hours of audio recordings. And she said what she heard on these tapes worried her and led her to now filing a lawsuit against the school that the teacher had called her child a loser and that the teacher had said negative things about the child and negative things about the mother. So I want to let you hear some of this, and then I want to ask you some questions. How much of this do you think is the teacher's fault? Is mom annoying? Is the, is the school, is the kid annoying? Is this bad enough that the teacher should be disciplined? Is this bad enough the teacher should be fired? Or is this the mom just not understanding that it's hard to teach a room full of kindergartners? Right? So here, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to hear, but... Um, I want to get this fired up so you can actually hear what the teacher is saying. The first little part here is about how the child is a loser. All right, go ahead. So she said, Anthony and you, losers. So she was talking about the kid that this other kid was hanging out with. And then we get to the bubble. Remember when you were a kid and you had to fill in the bubbles on the test? The teacher's very upset that this young boy doesn't know how to bubble instead of circle. Listen to this. No, that is not, that's not bubbling. Do you understand what bubbling is? What is bubbling? One is circle and the other one is to bubble. If I tell you bubble, what, what do I mean by bubbling in November? We don't know what I mean. Raise your hand if you know how to bubble. Aaron doesn't know. He's circling. Bubble. Stop erasing. Bubble. You bubble either this one or this one or this one. Bubble. I think she's a little upset about the bubbling. I don't know. What is the circle? What the other one is the bubble. If I tell you to bubble, what do I mean by bubbling? And then, hey, who here knows how to bubble? I mean, come on, raise your hand if you're not a bubble. Aaron doesn't know how to bubble, so she's calling this kid out in front of all of his peers. She's called him a loser. I don't think there's any excuse for ever calling a child a loser in your classroom, right? Then she's calling him out for not knowing how to bubble and embarrassing him in front of the entire class. Is, is that ever the way to motivate people? See, I, I think, unfortunately, some people think that is the way to motivate. I think because we had bad teachers, bad coaches, and bad bosses, and we've seen them try to motivate people by humiliating them and embarrassing them. I guess every once in a while somebody's motivated by that. All that does is make me mad and 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 really tear somebody down. I mean... That makes no sense to me for a five-year-old kid that you're going to call them out and embarrass them in front of the entire class instead of trying to, you know, motivate them in a, in a more positive way. Now, listen, I am not one of these people that say kids shouldn't be disciplined. I, I, I think we're way too soft on kids now. And part of the reason is because the Barack Obama presidency said that it wasn't fair, the, uh, there were some... Uh, disappropri- uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, disproportionate discipline based on skin color. It seemed like more black children were being disciplined than white children, and therefore uh, it must be racist. You know, well, wait a second. Um, how many times did these children misbehave? Is because it, it was the same behavior, but how many times was it the same behavior? And so what's happening is we're disciplining less. And and I know in I have a lot of teacher friends, and my wife's a teacher, and they'll tell me there are times we're not allowed to discipline at all. Like the, the kid is cussing us out and there's really nothing we can do. Or the kid walks out of the classroom and all we can do is, is report that the kid left. I'm like, what? Are you kidding? And so, no, I, I think kids should be disciplined. But we're talking about a five-year-old kid that was circling instead of bubbling. And this is what you're going to do? That's the way to reach him? Okay, so she continues. This is another little piece from the mother secretly recording the teacher talking to a five-year-old kindergartner. Aaron, go ahead. I don't know what to tell her. 
All I can tell you is that you don't want to do it right. You still don't know how to write. Okay, it's hard to hear, but she says, you got to do it again. You got to start here again. Your mom is going to come and see this. I don't know what to tell your mom. I have no idea how to help her. You don't want to do it right, honey. Do it again so I can show it to her. I don't know what to tell her. All I can tell is that you don't want to do it right. You still don't know how to write. All right. Now, here's the side where I will kind of support this teacher. We don't know how many times she's tried to teach this kid. And this is why I couldn't be a kindergarten teacher. All right. This is why I really couldn't be an elementary school teacher. Because if I show you how to do something and you don't know and you can't do it, I'll show you again. You still can't do it? I'll show you again. After about the fourth or fifth time, I'm going to be like, dude, I'm done. I've done, I've tried to help you. I don't know what else I can do for you. But a good teacher will find another way to try to explain it to the child and another way to try and explain it to the child and say, you know, hey, just keep working on it. You'll get it eventually. But there's got to come a point where you start to just let your frustration out a little bit on when is this kid going to get it, right? So what do you think? Is the teacher out of control here? Has the teacher gone beyond what she's supposed to do with a five-year-old little boy? That's the part you got to remember. You're the big 33-year-old teacher. He's the five-year-old little boy. He looks up to you. All the kids around, he's worried about how do they think about him. He hopefully is trying his best. And see, that's the part we don't know either. Was he trying or was he defying her? There's a lot of stuff we don't know about this, right? But then she gets in talking about his mom. Listen to this. I don't know what to say to your mom. She's driving me crazy. Why is she driving me crazy? I don't understand. I don't know what to say to your mom. She's driving me crazy. Why is she driving me crazy? I don't understand. Now, now hang on a second. Um, why would you ever talk to the five-year-old kid about it? It's not the five-year-old kid's fault what his mom does. And, and that's a part where I think she also stepped over the line. That doesn't make any sense to me. All right. There's a little bit more here that we'll get in just a second. So my, my, my point to you is, is this all the teacher's fault? How much is the teacher's fault? How much maybe is the mom's fault? How much could be the kid's fault? If this was your child and you had this recording, where the teacher called him a loser, where the teacher called him out in front of the other students, where the teacher said, you're not doing it right, you don't know how to do it, you still can't write, I don't know what your mom wants, your mom's driving me crazy, would that be enough for you to say, I want my kid out of that classroom? And do you think the, the, the teacher should be disciplined in any way? The, the mom's still trying to decide if she's going to sue the school over this. Because the school says, so far, no disciplinary action is going to take place. They did move her child into another classroom, and after they did... He's now on the honor roll. Hmm. And the mom says his behavior is back to normal. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board. 844-DIG-CHAD. My name's Greg Knapp. In for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. Sniffling, sneezing, stuffy head thing going on. Time for your daily dose of vitamin chat. I feel sorry for your mom, okay? You ready, Chad? Yeah. My mom? Yes. Yep, she said, you know, does your mom want to see a nice job or a loser's job? <laughs> and she said, you know, I feel sorry for your mom. Uh, is this teacher going after this kindergartner? She called him a loser. Uh, embarrassed him in front of the class, saying he didn't know how to bubble. Everybody else knows how to bubble. Starts talking about his mom, complaining about his mom. Uh, so is the teacher out of line, or is the teacher just trying to get this kid to behave? And just trying to get this kid to give his best effort. So mom removes him from the classroom, and he does better. He's on the honor roll now. He did better with behavior, and she wants some discipline on this teacher let me get anthony in in india about it anthony you're on the chad benson show my name is greg knapp go right ahead hello um i think you know I, I definitely remember when i was you know that age there was definitely some ribbing from teachers that you know parents might have not been excited about it but you know there especially in certain schools you know there's there's big class sizes there's frustration and when you have that kind of recording you know, uh, for that length of time, you know, it, it's probably pretty easy to go through 
and, and fine little things. That being said, I think that, you know, there is an appropriate standard of behavior for a five-year-old kid. Yeah, I think you made a great point about she has 32 hours of audio, and we heard, you know, little snippets of about maybe a minute total. And so, yeah, you can cherry pick the very worst things, and it's a very difficult job. But do you ever call the kid a loser? That that was the one that got me. No, I and I, I definitely, I mean, that's what stuck out to me. I think that's probably where they crossed the line. Now, like, if, if I think, you know, that deserves litigation, that's a different argument, but. Exactly. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, Anthony. I, I, I'm torn on this, too, because, look, I'm trying to look at this if this was my kid. If it was my little girl and I heard a recording where the, her kindergarten teacher called her a loser, my kid's out of that class. And, yes, I want a meeting with that teacher, and I want a meeting with that principal. Now, do I want the teacher fired? No. I'm not going to say I want her fired, but I definitely want my kid out of that class. You don't call my kid a loser. Now, if my kid is misbehaving and openly defiant to the teacher, and then the teacher is starting to get mad at the child and saying, you need to behave better, and you need to quit this behavior, and you need to listen to me, and I'm going to call your dad, I'm behind the teacher 100%. But you don't call my kid a loser. That's a whole different level of bad bad teaching. So the the other side of this is I don't know how this mom is. Is this mom a crazy mom? There are crazy, crazy parents. And they will go in and they will make the teacher's life a living hell. And at some point, the teacher just gets so frustrated that, yes, she may say some things to the kid about it, too. So I, I, I have a feeling there's probably much more to the story than we know. But no, you can't call him a loser. Come on. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD and you are in. Kimberly Strassel has a great piece in the Wall Street Journal today. She's been following this Trump-Russia collusion narrative for a very long time and doing a great job of doing some reporting that nobody else has been doing. And she's broken some of the stories on just how out of the ordinary and perhaps even illegal some of the actions of the FBI have been. And she says, is today the day the FBI will come clean? Because today is the day that Congress gave the FBI as a deadline. A House resolution set today as the deadline for the Justice Department to give all the information on how this investigation into the Trump campaign actually began. See, They've been holding stuff back. They've been flouting subpoenas. They've been playing games with redactions and deadlines. And if you remember, when some of this stuff was made public by the House committee, the Democrats and the FBI were like, when this is made public, when this is made public, it's going to endanger national security and it's going to endanger some of our sources. And it's just one of the worst things that's ever happened in the world. And then it happened and everybody went, that's it. That doesn't endanger anything. And you started to say, wait a second, then maybe the FBI is lying about the reasons for them not giving this information to these congressional committees. Because there was nothing in that information that was released that hurt America at all. And so why are they doing this? Could it be because they're trying to cover their own backside? Yes. It's why the House Republicans united just last week. They voted for a resolution demanding submission to Congress's requests for documents. And if not, they will be held in contempt. And then they will have to take even further measures if they will not cooperate. Now, the really weird thing about all this is, though, it's President Trump's FBI. President Trump is the chief of the executive branch. The FBI is part of the executive branch. The president, by law, He has the right to declassify anything he wants to be declassified. He could order the FBI to turn over all these documents without any redactions at all to Congress if he wanted to. Or he could have people go in there to say these are the redactions that should stay. Why isn't he doing it? I want to get into that in just a minute with you. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad. This is the Chad Benson Show. Chad Benson Show. Enter.
independent in thought and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Hey, how you doing? My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. You can go 844-DIG-CHAD on your phone. You're in the program. You can go to thechadshow.com on the internet. And we're talking about will the FBI come clean? A great piece by Kimberly Strassel of the Wall Street Journal. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Because Susan wanted to jump in on this teacher in Miami. She was teacher of the year at this elementary school. But five-year-old in her class was having behavior problems at home. His behavior had changed. His grades were poor. He didn't, was crying to go to school. And mom's like, what's wrong? And she found out the teacher was calling him a bad boy. And so they recorded her without her knowledge, 32 hours of recording. And it turns out that the teacher called the boy a loser. Uh, and embarrassed him in front of the class, saying he didn't know how to bubble instead of circle uh said i feel sorry for your mom your mom's driving me crazy i don't know what to say to your mom and finally mom got him out of the class and once he got into the other class he became an honor roll student and so she's very upset at the school and the teacher susan wanted to chime in on that susan you are on the chad benson show my name's greg knapp filling in go right ahead hi greg i feel as if Kindergarten is an extremely important time in a child's life. I actually am a grandmother of two little boys, six and four. And um, little boys, a lot of times, are not quite as mature as little girls. And True. so they, a lot of times, they um, do better if you maybe hold them back a year. That's but true. I think if you shape a child's life in kindergarten that they don't like school, that can affect their entire outcome for their entire 12 years in school. I think and, you're and exactly so I right. Like, and, I, and I'll tell you, Susan, you know, uh, for so long we've said that, that girls have been at a disadvantage in school because girls aren't as aggressive and so girls wouldn't raise their hands as much. And, and all that's been true, but we've worked so hard to reverse that that – we're losing a couple generations of boys in school for exactly what you're saying, that they've they've come to hate school. And if you hate school, it's very hard to have a love for learning and to do well to get the degrees that you need to do the great jobs that are out there. And you end up, you know, not reaching your full potential. School is not very conducive to what most little boys want to do. And I know this isn't politically correct to say there's a difference between girls and boys, but we all know there is. And, and most little boys have a very hard time sitting still in a desk for hours at a time writing and doing exactly what the teacher tells them to do. And, 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 if, and if you're going to make it even worse by humiliating him and calling him a loser and then talking to him about his mom when he can't do anything about what his mom does, how does that help? I would like to know if this teacher is a parent or if she's just a young new school teacher because if you're not a parent you don't understand that children have moods too and um so if she's not around a lot of children and doesn't have to be around them other than in teaching situations i'm i always feel like you need to be a mother before you should be a teacher it definitely helps Uh, she's 33 years old i don't know if she has any children Uh, she is a she she is a I'm sorry she's a 33 year veteran teacher I don't know if she has any kids but she's been around a long time and that may be part of it too once you've been around for a while sometimes you get a little jaded and sometimes you start thinking well these kids today and you start treating them maybe in a way that you wouldn't if you thought back to how would I want my five year old little boy to be treated and that that does have an influence in in what you do I appreciate the call Susan I think you made some great points there. Uh, I was just talking to my wife about this story before I did the show. My wife is a teacher. She's taught kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and fourth grade. And she's had kids who are very well behaved, and she's had children that have very bad behavior problems. And she said, I would never call a child a loser. She said, the second that a teacher starts calling a child a loser, that teacher should not be teaching anymore. I'm like, really? No, you don't call the kid a loser. You can talk about their behavior. You can do all kinds of things to try to change their behavior. So what about, you know, talking about the kid's mom saying, you know, uh, you know, your mom's driving me crazy and I don't know what I can do. She, no, you don't talk to the child about their mother. That It's not their child's fault. The, the mother could be driving her crazy. There are mothers that drive you crazy, but it's not the five-year-old child's fault. And you don't start driving a wedge between you and the child by talking about his mother. 
I said, so for you, if you were the principal, what would happen? She said, if I was the principal and I had a teacher that was calling the children losers and telling the children that their moms are driving me crazy, that teacher would not teach for me anymore. That's for my wife, who's a public school teacher. So, you know, uh, I definitely wouldn't have that my kid in that class. If, if, if you call my kid a loser, my kid's out of your class. There's no excuse for that. Now, if my kid calls you a loser, my kid's in really big trouble in my house. So it's it's not a one way street. I mean, I was I was brought up. The teacher called my house. You know, um, Mr. Knapp, I need to talk to you about Greg. He didn't behave very well yesterday, and I told him that he needed to do, do whatever, and he and and he didn't do it. Oh man, would I be in trouble? My dad would not get off the my not, my dad would not say to the teacher, "Oh yeah, well, what did you do to my son?" Oh no no no. My dad would say. Thank you very much for the call. I will absolutely take care of it, and this will not happen again. And then my dad would take care of it. So I'm not saying the kids don't need discipline. I'm just saying you don't call them a loser when they're five years old. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD, and you are on board. So back to the Kimberly Strassel thing with the FBI. They're, they, they're just telling Congress basically no. And they say, well, we've turned over this many documents. It doesn't matter how many documents you've turned over. Have you turned over the ones they've asked for? Well, we've turned, but have you turned over these? Well, no, not yet. Why not? Well, because it's national security. BS. All they want to know is how did this investigation get started? Where did you first ask the question about President Trump's campaign and Russia? When did you first go for the FISA warrants? What information did you use for the FISA warrants? Did you use this discredited, scandalous dossier that was provided, by the way, by Russians? No, it was a British guy. Yeah, it was a British guy who paid Russians to give him that information. So who colluded with the Russians? I mean, so it just gets a little crazy. So here's the big thing. What is the FBI's origin story on this investigation? Here's what they say. According to this, the FBI didn't launch its probe until July 31st, 2016. Now, that was after Australia tipped it to a conversation from a junior, junior, junior Trump aide, George Papadopoulos, when he was drunk with an Australian diplomat in the spring of 2016 in London. And only after the crossfire hurricane had begun did they use this information to get the inf- to FISA warrants they needed to do the spying and wiretapping and everything else. Now, the problem is the story's full of holes. No one has explained why two months passed between the Papadopoulos downer conversation, the guy from Australia, and the July 31st probe. We've learned it wasn't Australian intelligence that passed along the information, but Mr. Downer, the Australian diplomat, personally, to the State Department personnel. By the way, that's a violation of procedure. And a growing list of Trump officials now relate moments when they were approached by suspicious figures before July 31. So congressional investigators are saying, we think the FBI was investigating Trump officials before July 31st on the basis of the dossier and dubious information from the State Department officials. And they think the FBI was employing a variety of counterintelligence tools before there was an official probe. And this included deploying spies against political actors. And they suspect that only when the FBI decided it wanted to obtain a FISA warrant against Trump aide Carter Page, which, by the way, requires an official investigation, did it surface the downer information that they collected in May and use that for its pretext in July. Now, this gets a little complicated. I don't want you to go in the weeds. That was all from Kim Strassel at the Wall Street Journal. But what they're saying is that investigators now have credible evidence pointing to the use of FBI informants against the Trump campaign before July 31, before they got the FISA warrant. And last week's resolution requires the department to answer whether that's true, and if so, on what basis they were used. See, For months now, and years really, the FBI and its allies in the media have been lowering the bar on what is appropriate. We're now told it's okay that the government opened a counterintelligence probe into a presidential campaign. That it's okay that it obtained a warrant to spy on a U.S. citizen. 
okay that it based that warrant on an unverified dossier from the Democratic campaign and then hid that true origin from the FISA court. Okay that it paid a spy to target domestic political actors. No, it's not okay. And if it turns out that the Justice Department and the FBI lied about how and when this all started, it's scandalous. And worse, if it comes out that senior officials lied to Congress about whether they had complied with their demands for information, I mean, it's illegal. Once again, it's a reason for Trump to step in and declassify everything. Kimberly Strassel, Wall Street Journal. And that's the point I was making earlier. President Trump can declassify all this stuff tomorrow, today. Why hasn't he done it? And why won't he do it? I don't know. It's a question for you. Why doesn't Trump just say to the FBI and to the Department of Justice, you will give the House and Senate investigative committees everything they want now? And the only thing you will redact are names of sources that you're worried you will lose. Why doesn't he do that? You tell me. 844-DIG-CHAD gets you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD. Wait till you hear Alan Dershowitz, liberal lawyer who has been speaking out not to defend Trump, really, but to defend the rule of law, free speech, and what used to be called liberal ideas. Liberal not in the sense of, of, a, of a liberal party or a conservative party, but liberal ideas in the original definition of what liberal meant. But it seems like most liberals don't hold those anymore if President Trump is in the White House. Well, you heard that he was explaining that people on Martha's Vineyard don't want to hang around him anymore, and Joe Scarborough had a little pity party for him and said, oh, poor baby, Alan Dershowitz has responded. We've got that audio for you. He makes some very interesting points. We'll get to that in just a second. 844-DIG-CHAD, get you on board. 844-DIG-CHAD. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. Welcome to the last robot-free zone in America, where robot talk show hosts do not compute. Oh, what an awful dream. Ones and zeros everywhere. Do not, not compute. compute. Ugh, and I thought I saw it too. The Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad on The Chad Benson Show. You can jump in as well at 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. Before I get you Alan Dershowitz's audio, he was on with Tucker Carlson last night talking about what's going on with Martha Martha's Vineyard and the people there who don't like him anymore because he's had the audacity to stand up for free speech and to tell the truth about the rule of law with the Trump-Russian collusion investigation. I want to get your thoughts on everything as well. Ray wants to jump in. Ray, you are on the Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp filling in. Go right ahead. Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, I just wanted to say the reason that President Trump isn't doing that yet is it's because the Democrats are going to blame him, uh, saying that he's trying to interfere in the Russian investigation, getting it shut down, that he's trying to obstruct justice. They're going to use it as a talking point to justify another reason that they say the investigation should go on. Uh, another thing is he's going to be, they're going to say what he's trying to do is actually uh, fire Mueller and get rid of Rod Rosenstein. And what they're going to do is like they've done, especially the uh, senators here in the uh, the Congress in California, they use anything and they twist the words and try to make it sound like he's trying to get the investigation shut down. Even in the very beginning, let, he let said, me let me let me jump in on that, Ray. Uh, Ray's ref, uh, referencing a question I asked a minute ago. With all the information that has been withheld from the congressional committees by the FBI and the Justice Department, where the House is having to order them to release it by today on how this thing started, how did they get the FISA warrants? Uh, why doesn't Trump just declassify it all? As the president, he can declassify anything. If he says it's declassified, it is. Everything you just said there, Ray, the Democrats are already saying about President Trump, right? They're already claiming he's obstructing justice. They're already saying he's trying to undermine the Mueller probe. They're already saying everything that you just said. And I agree with you. Absolutely. They will, I agree with you. They will say it even louder if he does this. However, how about this, Ray? How about President Trump ha has a... Uh, Ha, tells all the networks, I have a statement to make. And he comes out and he says, look, for two years this investigation has been going on. It's hurting America. It's hurting our 
economy. It's hurting everything that we're trying to do to keep our country moving forward. So here's what we need to do. We need to get all the facts out there and let the American people decide on the truth of this. So I am now ordering that all this information is declassified for the congressional committees so they can do their work, they can do their oversight, and we can get this done. Now, I agree with you, the Democrats are going to go crazy about it, but do you think the average American is going to say declassifying the information so that America can see it, not hide it, but see it, and so that we can see the real facts of this case, that that would be a bad thing? No, that would be a good thing, and I think he should do it. I'm just saying if he does it, he says one little thing, and they're going to take a whole week and make all this different allegations about it. So I think he should do it, and I believe he's going to, but he's going to wait until, and maybe it's going to be soon, like you said, that he can come out and justify and maybe get behind the bully pulpit and sit down, sit down and you know, have a press conference, like you're saying, Right. And tell the American people that it's time that this gets over, because I, I don't believe that he uh, was involved in Russian collusion in and of himself. Did somebody in his campaign talk to somebody at the wrong time when they were representing themselves as somebody trying to help the campaign? It looks like they were trying to put people in there to set him up. Oh, yeah, they but, were. And uh, here's the thing, Ray. So to me, um, I want to know. I want to know everything. I want to know, like you said, were they trying to set people up? Were there some people in the Trump campaign that wanted to work with them? Did they ever work with them? And I also want to know everything that happened with the Democrats and what they were doing with the dossier and what they were doing with Russians and what they were doing to try to influence the election. And I want to know if the FBI was doing things that they're not supposed to do, lying to FISA court judges and spying on the presidential campaign of the of the party that is out of power. I want to know all that stuff. And I'll tell you, as much as you said, this would be a huge news story about Trump's trying to manipulate the the, the procedures and uh, undermine Mueller and blah, blah, blah. If we get a couple bombshells out of that stuff that shows that they did use the dossier for the FISA and only the dossier and that they they did spy on the Trump campaign. Well, that's going to blow any other story out of the water. So let's get the facts out there and let's let the American people really see the complete story. And I think when you see the complete story, then that's going to be much more important than any talking point from a Democrat. It is. And the reason that they don't want it out there, the Democrats, and the reason they've been fighting so hard is, if you think about the emails that have been released, do you think with Weissman and all the people that they've got on there that they were the only people that didn't want Trump to win? No, it's a good point. i got to let you run, Ray, but it's a great point. All the text messages and all the emails and all the bias that we've seen... Yeah, we need all the truth. Thanks for getting in. Great comments. We'll get you the Alan Dershowitz stuff in just a second as well. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on The Chad Benson Show. This is The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thoughts and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Hey, how you doing? Happy Friday to you. My name is Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson on the Chad Benson Show. You can go to thechadshow.com for more information and to get on all the different social media outlets to chat with Chad. And you can jump in on the program at 844-DIG-CHAD. 844 dig chat i want to start with alan dershowitz because he ties right into what's going on with the illegal immigration thing and the illegal immigration thing just keeps getting bigger and bigger every day to the point now to the point now that immigration is the top issue for u.s voters economy is second place now whoa all right we'll get into that in just a minute it ties right in together so alan dershowitz i don't know if you've been following and paying attention he's he's a very far left well I mean, he really can't say he's far left anymore because the left has gone really far left. He's a lefty. He's a liberal. 
but he's the kind of liberal you can talk with. You know, like you could say, well, I, I disagree with you. I think this. He goes, well, I disagree with you. I think this. And you can have like a real conversation and maybe drink a beer together. And he's a guy that's been standing up for free speech and for the rule of law. And a lot of people on the left hate it because he's pointed out how free speech and the rule of law are on the side of President Trump. And so they don't like that. And it's gotten to the point where Dershowitz said, you know, people on Martha's Vineyard don't want to hang around me anymore. And they're being a little bit mean to me. And Morning Joe got very up. Oh, oh, poor Alan Dershowitz, poor baby. Right. So Alan Dershowitz hit back last night on the Tucker Carlson show. And he was on there and he starts off talking to Tucker Carlson about, hey, listen, man, um, I haven't changed. I have always been on the side of civil liberties. There's stuff about Trump I don't like, and I tell Trump the stuff that I don't like when I when I have an opportunity. But I'm going to stand up for civil liberties. Here's cut one. I am making the same arguments about civil liberties I've made for 50 years and that I would be making if Hillary Clinton had been elected president and people were trying to impeach her. He's right. He's been consistent. It's the people on the left that are being the hypocrites about this. And then he gives a story about what he was talking about on how he's being treated on Martha's Vineyard. You know, people talk about parties as if that's something serious. I don't care about parties. I'm invited to too many. But at a party this week on Martha's Vineyard, a woman said, if Dershowitz were here tonight, I'd stab him through the heart. This is a Martha's Vineyard woman saying she would stab me through the heart. What do you mean this is a Martha's Vineyard? Is that some kind of a uh, statement about the kind of people that are Martha's Vineyard? Hmm? Yes, you bet you it is. On Martha's Vineyard, we don't normally stab people through the heart. I mean, this is not Chicago. They shoot people in Chicago. They don't stab a man. Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You know what I mean, darling. We we don't do the stabbings here as Martha's Vineyard. Hmm? So Dershowitz is like, man, you know it's bad. When the, you know, the the... the Heidi tidies are telling you that they want to stab you through the heart in Martha's Vineyard. And it, it, it bothers them. And he went on talking about this whole campaign against them. Another Martha's Vineyard, a professor at uh, MIT, Professor Nicholas Negroponte, who has previously said he wished there were no New York Times and that people only got the news that represented their own personal worldview so that they wouldn't hear opposing points of view, the same guy who said soon there'll be a pill that you can swallow and you'll learn French overnight, so you won't have to go through the process of learning French. He's leading the campaign to try to get other people to uh, shun me in every way and not to engage with me. Um, Now they're losing because the vast majority of people, even in Martha's Vineyard and in Chilmark, can't stand people who try to stop speech and try to stop debate. So it's backfiring. Wow, that was very interesting. There was a lot in there. So he's talking about this professor that says you should only read news and listen to news that you agree with. Wow, that's that's a huge problem. See, I was talking the other day to a friend about this. You know, I'm a conservative. I tell you that straight up front. That's my opinion. But I don't only read conservative news. And I don't only watch conservative news. I don't only listen to conservative news because then I'd only get one point of view. And it's it's really hard if I wanted to do that because I live in this world where it's really dominated in a lot of areas by liberals uh, in entertainment industry, in a lot of our courts, in a, in a lot of our newsrooms. I mean, when you look at the number one newsrooms in city after city, L.A. Times, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, um, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, these are all left-leaning news organizations. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, these are all left-leaning news organizations. You basically got Fox and some conservative websites, right? So it's much easier for liberals to only listen to liberal news than it is for conservatives. But as a talk show, man, I'm always reading both sides. I'm watching CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and ABC, and I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal and from conservative websites, and from the New York Times, and from the LA Times, and from the Wall Street Journal, because I want to see all the different opinions and then decide for myself. Isn't that what we should be teaching at school? So here's this professor saying, no, you should only listen to the stuff you agree with, and only, of course, if you agree with me. And it sounds like he's trying to say, if you don't want the New York Times because the New York Times is too conservative, holy crap, this dude must be quite a piece of work. Then George Rich is saying, this guy wants to shun me. 
And he doesn't want people to even hear the other side. And and as Tucker Carlson and he go back and forth, Dershowitz wants to point out that he doesn't think this is a liberal thing. This is a far left radical thing. Let's hear cut four. The Democratic Party and the left has been taken over by radicals who have no interest in I due process. They're like Negroponte. They only want their truth to prevail. They don't want any dissent. They don't want any argument. He's right, isn't he? I mean, he's right. They they don't want to hear the other side. Now, let's be fair about this. I know people that don't want to hear anything from the left. They want to embed themselves into conservative websites only and uh, conservative talk shows only and Fox News during their opinion pieces only. And by the way, I think Fox News gets a very bad rap about being conservative only. Their primetime lineup is conservative political opinion, for sure. But during the day, uh, Fox and Friends is like that quite a bit, too. They're they're definitely more pro-Trump. But the rest of the day, the news part of their show is much more balanced, according to, not me, to actual scientific research done when they look at stories and say how many were pro-Trump, how many were anti-Trump, how many were pro-liberal, how many were pro-conservative, that that Fox News comes down in the middle much more than these other news outlets claiming to be unbiased. But I know people that want to embed themselves in listening to nothing but conservative talk and reading nothing but conservative websites, and I don't think that's good either. We need to see as much as we can from both sides and get the full picture and then decide for ourselves what the truth is. And, you know, it it goes right to a story that came out today, I think it was, where the AP was saying that the military, the army, is is discharging immigrants. And they made it sound like, well, this must be a Trump thing, and this must be because they're going after these immigrants. Well, as the story comes out, you find out that there is absolutely zero proof that they're being discharged because they're immigrants. And in fact, i, I got to give it to NPR of all places, where one of the NPR reporters came out and said, you know, you guys might want to tap the brakes on this AP piece until we know more about it. Wait till you hear what this guy tweeted out. Okay, so the AP says, some immigrant U.S. Army reservists and recruits who enlisted in the military with a promised path to citizenship are being abruptly discharged. But you read through the AP piece and there's no evidence whatsoever it's because they're immigrants. All right. So NPR's reporter Tim Mack starts tweeting out. Hang on a second, guys. My first impression on this AP story about the army discharging immigrant recruits is that there is less than meets the eye here. What the AP needs to show is evidence of a policy shift in the army. It hasn't done that. This AP article is about immigrants who have enlisted but not gone to basic training. People who enlist but then cannot go to basic for whatever reason are discharged all the time. I bet I could find 40 recruits discharged because of being fat. That's Tim Mack. He goes on and says, there are a number of innocuous explanations for these discharges. Perhaps these immigrant recruits could not pass a background check. By the way, there are jobs in the military that don't require clearance. The AP does not ask the simple question. Did a policy change here? Then there's Air Force veteran John Noonan. He put a thread out, uh, Daily Caller reporting on this. And he said he broke down the information the AP story did not include, noting many of the same issues brought up by by uh, Mac and others. He said, here's what I think the AP reporter got a little confused on. When you raise your hand and take an oath, you belong to the military, but you're not technically in the military. It's common to get the oath out of the way while initial background checks are ongoing. If you clear a background investigation, great, off to basic, then to specialty training. Congrats, private, airman, or sailor, you're in. But if you have some issues that pop up during the background investigation and don't go off to training, it's a canceled contract. If you separate within 180 days of service, you're given an entry-level separation. It's not an honorable discharge. It's not a dishonorable discharge. It's just, hey, this isn't going to work. This 180 days requirement reiterated in Section 3A of the memo, and he includes that. And, and he goes on and on to explain this. So to summarize, immigrants are still welcome to earn citizenship through service. DOD is not conducting widespread expulsion of non-citizens. Participation in this program is down, but maybe due to external factors like the strong economy or stricter federal immigration law. So, so there's, there's absolutely zero evidence that there was a change in the military policy at all. 
Zero evidence that Trump asked for anything to change. Zero evidence that there are more immigrants being being said no to between the time they take the oath and are actively going to basic. And yet the AP made it seem like that's what was going on in the way they put presented this story. And that's why people are more likely to start saying fake news. Now, the whole Alan Dershowitz thing that I started plays right into this other story when he said it's the radicals, it's the far leftists, not the Democrats that are the problem here. That's Alan Dershowitz. Like uh, The problem is, to me, there's a lot more of those far lefties then, and he needs to explain which are which. But this this woman, this 28-year-old woman who won with a 20% turnout vote in New York, who is a Democrat socialist, we need to know a little bit more about the Democrat Socialists of America. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Well, we've got a little bit more information for you on, on it and to see just how far left it is. Are these the radicals that Alan Dershowitz is talking about? And what does that mean for the future of the Democratic Party and for our country? We'll get to that in just a minute. My name's Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad Benson on The Chad Benson Show. Take one giant step to the left. Don't ever have anyone embarrass you like this. One giant step to the right. That's all that separates you from everything else that came from slime. You are now in the alt-middle, where it's just right. Call if you get weird. This is The Chad Benson Show. And my name is Greg Knapp. I'm filling in for Chad on The Chad Benson Show. We were talking about Alan Dershowitz, a liberal lawyer, and people on the left are saying they want to stab him through the heart. Wow. And he says, well, really, it's the radicals now, the radical left that have gone away from what liberals really stand for, free speech, rule of law, etc. I'm like, well, that's kind of what conservatives stand for, free speech, rule of law, etc. Yeah, it's even things we used to agree with that now the left just won't even talk about. So it made me start thinking about the radicals, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's the 28-year-old, self-avowed, democratic socialist who won a primary in New York City. And she only won with 20% voter turnout. I I think she got 16,000 votes and the other guy got 10,000 votes. I mean, it's not like 16 million votes, but... You know, hey, the fact that she won is pretty crazy. She's a big Bernie Sanders protege. So you start to say, what's going on with the Democratic Party if they're Democrat Socialists of America? Well, they're not really the Democrats. They're the Democratic Socialists of America, but they're trying to push the Democratic Party far, far left. Well, DNC Chairman Tom Perez came out and said she represents the future of our party. Now, what exactly is the Democrat Socialists of America? and the people who are in it, and the groups that support it. Well, the Daily Caller and other organizations are now calling up and trying to find out more information about it, and they're finding some very interesting things. On June 30th, the Portland co-chair of the Democrat Socialists of America wrote this. As a DSA chapter co-chair, I just want to set the record straight for a minute. Communism is good. Now, she's the co-chair. Oh, it's only one, Greg. Oh, no, hold on. Then the Democrat Socialists of America's Charlottesville chair quoted the tweet from Ms. Smith and wrote this. As a DSA chapter co-chair, I would like to co-sign this pro-communist statement. Then DSA chairs in Seattle and Hudson County, New Jersey added their support. So we've got four co-chairs of the Democrat Socialists of America Party across the nation saying communism is good. Now, look, they have every right to say that. But the people that are trying to say, well, Democrat Socialists, I mean, it's not really socialist. They're saying communism is good. Well, you know, communism is good. Really? Okay. well, if that's what you want to run on, knock yourself out and we'll see how many votes you get in a national election. The Constitution of the Democrat Socialists of America proclaims its members are socialists because we reject an economic order based on private profit, excuse me, private profit, alienated labor, whatever that is, and gross inequalities of wealth and power. Well, at least they're being honest. They don't want any private profit. 
And they don't like the inequalities of wealth and power. Well, here's look, I don't like it either if it's done based on breaking the law. But there's always going to be inequalities of wealth and power. Some people are going to be born with higher intelligence than others. Some are then going to work harder than others. Some are going to work to get better degrees than others. Some are going to start businesses and some won't. There's going to be differences in this. And that's okay. And by the way, you can have an increase in inequality and still do better. Let's say your neighbor is making $100,000 a year and you're making $80,000 a year. And next year, your neighbor gets a $20,000 raise and you get a $10,000 raise. So now your neighbor's making 120000 a year and you're making 90000 a year. The inequality increased between you and your neighbor. But you're still making 10000 more than you did last year. I think I'd be happy with that. Nope. So, by the way, this Democrat Socialists of America New York City arm is now demanding an end to national borders and an end to private profit. This is the one this is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez belongs to. Let's run on that. Wow. My name is Greg Knapp. In for Chad Benson. Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent in thought and punk rock in life. It's the Chad Benson Show. Hey, how you doing? My name is Greg Knapp. I'm in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. We were wrapping up this discussion of just how radical the Democrat Socialists of America are. They're calling the New York City arm, which Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a dues-paying member of, demanded an end to national borders and an end to private profit. Private profit. Wow. Okay. You know, it's interesting. People say, well, you know, socialism works in Norway and Sweden, so it can happen here and be great here, too. Well, those countries still have borders. Those countries still allow private profit. They release dividends to investors. The World Bank ranking Norway and Sweden as similar to the United States in terms of regulatory barriers to starting and maintaining a business, reporting the Daily Caller. But how about this? Uh, we've got the Democrat Socialists of America saying that they don't really want to be Democrats. And they want a classless society, by the way. And they say, we believe this vision can only be realized through the abolition of classes, common ownership of the means of production, and its democratic management to meet the needs of all. That's the Libertarian Socialist Caucus. And then we've got this. Citing Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, his success during the 2016 Democratic primary, one Democratic Socialist of America member said, the current Democratic Party is a sinking ship. That was last year's DSA convention. DSA is not tied to the Democratic Party. We tie our strategy. Why tie our strategy to a sinking ship? It's a statement of action from last year's convention. DSA, Democrat Socialist of America, has the opportunity to create a major democratic socialist party in America capable of replacing the Democratic Party. DSA should lead this movement and define the party of the future. Now, they say they're open to running on the Democratic Party ticket when it's necessary, but they say this is a means to further its hard left message. There you go. And, and, and it goes to this whole idea of open borders and no immigration and no ICE, no immigration enforcement and no ICE. And there's a new report out from Reuters today that immigration is now the top issue for U.S. voters. It, this poll was done between June 28th and July the 2nd, right during all of this immigration stuff that's been on the news day in and day out. And now 15 percent of U.S. registered voters say immigration is the top issue in determining how they're going to vote in November. 14 percent said the economy was number one. So now immigration has become number one. Okay, now, is that because of Democrats or Republicans? And the reason that's important, if Democrats are saying it's their number one thing to vote for, 
then they're going to be motivated to vote against Republicans, right? Because they don't like what the Republicans do. If it's the number one issue for Republicans, then they're going to be motivated to vote for more Republicans. So it might really impact the election. So what did the poll show? It showed this. 26% of registered Republicans cited immigration as their most important issue. That's up 14 percentage points from June. Wow. Only 7% of Democrats say immigration is their top concern. Think about that. 26% of Republicans say it's their top concern and they like what Trump is doing. 7% of Democrats say it's their top concern and they don't like what Trump is doing. That th- this this may really end up hurting Democrats. Remember how the media's been telling, oh man, the immigration issue is really going to hurt Republicans. It's it's really going to. Di- That's not what it looks like right now, especially as you have Democrats have coming out saying they want to abolish ICE and they want to get rid of borders. Nobody's saying that. Oh yeah, they are. Um, there was a a you know all these abolish ICE. And Occupy ICE movements around the country, the one in New York, there were people out there chanting, no borders, no nations. <laughs> this is what they want. And and the vast majority of America, even a majority of Democrats are not saying they want to abolish ICE. And of course, what they really mean is abolish all the borders. There's a great piece from The Hill where they say, you know, the push to abolish ICE is the outgrowth of the growing belief on the left that no illegal alien should ever be deported unless they've been convicted of a non-immigration crime. But this view actually predates the Democrats' latest socialist sweetheart. Representative Nancy Pelosi, Democrat California, said back in 2013, quote, Our view of the law is, if somebody is here without sufficient documentation... That is not reason for deportation. Did you hear that? That was from Nancy Pelosi five years ago. Our view of the law is if somebody is here without sufficient documentation, that is not reason for deportation. So what she's really saying is she doesn't want the law enforced. I mean, so of course, that's what they've been saying for years. Now they just have people who are openly admitting they want no borders. So you're telling me if somebody comes to this country legally with a visa and overstays their visa and never leaves, they shouldn't be deported. That's right. If somebody sneaks across the border and doesn't get caught and they're here and they're hanging out here, they should never be deported. That's right. So if we ever catch somebody for whatever reason, let's say they're working somewhere and they're not allowed to work here legally because they're not supposed to be here legally, they should not be deported. That's right. So basically you're saying don't enforce any of our immigration laws. Oh, no, that's not what we mean. Yes, it is. And guess what? The vast majority of the American people don't agree with that. This is going to backfire on these Democrats big time. I mean, I don't know how you can think it doesn't. Well, it's a trap they're walking right into. 844-DIG-CHAD, get you on board the program. 844-DIG-CHAD, and you are in. Did you see what Hawaii is doing? Hawaii has now become... The first state in the United States to ban sunscreen. Wait, wait. Hawaii's, Hawaii has a lot of sun. They have a lot of tourists. They have people that need sunscreen. Well, they're not banning all types of sunscreen. I mean, there are some you can still use, but they're banning the kind of sunscreen that you use because the vast majority of all sunscreen has a couple chemicals in it that Hawaii says you shouldn't be able to use. Oxybenzone and octanoxate. And I love how this is put by the AccuWeather staff writer Amanda Smith. These chemicals are believed to harm coral reefs and other marine ecosystems. Wait, they're believed to hurt coral reefs? Or have they been scientifically proven to harm coral reefs? And by the way, in what amounts? I mean, you're telling me how many people in Hawaii are putting on so much sunscreen that when they go into the water, it's destroying the coral reefs. You mean instead of the fertilizer runoff from the cattle farms in Hawaii or the other agriculture that's going on in Hawaii or the 
oil leaking off the streets that in the runoff that leads to the ocean in Hawaii? You're telling me the main problem with destroying the reef, what's really doing it, is the people who are wearing sunscreen? Maybe we should have a little proof of that. No, we don't need proof. See, this is virtue signaling. This is not about saving the coral reefs. This is trying to say, I'm better than you. Oh, look, we we have some people that say that these two chemicals are not good for the coral reefs. Therefore, since we care about the coral reefs more than you, and we're more environmentally friendly than you, and we're more politically correct than you, we've got to do something. We've got to pass a law. And then once this law is done, watch these coral reefs grow. Is, is there anyone really? Is there any scientist that is actually going to go on the record and tell you, by getting rid of these sunscreens, you're going to stop the destruction of the coral reefs in Hawaii? No, I guarantee you there's nobody that's going to say that, but it sure sounds good. And it starts January 1st, 2021. Wait a second. Why would you wait two and a half years? I mean, if we're destroying the coral reefs, why not ban this now? I mean, there are other sunscreens you can use. There's a whole list of them at the Environmental Working Group website, a list of reef safe sunscreen brands. I mean, I'm sure they cost more and maybe it's harder to get, but hey, what price would you not pay to save the coral reefs of Hawaii? Why would you have to wait two years for this? Because it doesn't really matter, but it makes you feel good. And it makes you somebody that's going to get the attention of the voter. And then they're going to say, I'm voting for that guy that really cares about the coral reefs. Yeah, yeah. He He's one of the good guys. He's not one of those awful people putting on. So how are they going to enforce this, by the way? Are they, are they not going to allow the sunscreens that have those two chemicals in there to even be sold in Hawaii? Because what if you're just going to lay out by your pool? Can you not use that sunscreen? Are they not going to let you bring it in? Are they going to check everybody's bag at the airport on the way to Hawaii to make sure they don't have that type of sunscreen? Is, is there going to be a uh, sunscreen police that drives by while you're lathering up on the Hawaiian beaches to make sure you're using the right kind of sunscreen? These people are nuts. It's just one more piece of craziness for you to consume. 844-DIG-CHAD, if you'd like to chime in on that one. 844-DIG-CHAD. Hey, they said, look, uh, you know, if you've got this prescribed by your doctor, you can still use it. Well, n- why? we got to take care of these coral reefs. There are lots of other things they can use. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I've got, this is the big question for the end of the show. Okay, let's start this right now. There's a new poll out by Gallup, and it asks this question. Is it easier to raise a boy or easier to raise a girl? And they've been asking this question for years. And the question consistently gets the same answer. And I'm just surprised that they're even able to ask this question anymore. I mean, because remember, there really are no boys or girls. I mean, gender is something that's fluid. I mean, gender gender is not objective. Gender is not scientific. It's just, it's a fluid thing. So to even ask if I have a boy or a girl as a son or a daughter seems a little bit politically incorrect to me and a little bit gender phobic. So I don't even know if I like this question. But the question's out there, so I'll ask it to you. Which is easier to raise, little boys or little girls? I'm going to get you all the details on what the Gallup survey showed Get your response to it. I've got a couple girls, so I've got a little idea on this as well. 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. My name's Greg Knapp, filling in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. Deep states? Uh, No, deep doo-doo? Yeah, the Chad Benson Show. My name is Greg Knapp, filling in for Chad, Chad Benson Show, 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD online, thechadshow.com. Got a couple things left for you in the program. One is this question, which type of children are easier to raise, little boys or little girls? And Gallup asked the question, what do you think? It's not even close. Not even close. By a two-to-one margin now, Andrew Malcolm reporting, Americans say raising little boys is easier than raising little girls. 
54% to 27%. Now, Gallup asked this question first in 1947, and back then, 42% said easier for boys, 24% girls. So the boys are pulling into the lead even more than that, but it's always been from the first time they asked this question that it's easier to raise boys than girls. Why? Why? And, and for younger people, it's even worse in, in terms, I guess worse is the bad word. It's even a bigger d uh, difference. For young people, both men, both young men and young women, they say 62% boys are easier to raise. 22% girls are easier to raise. So that brings you to the big question, why? Now Gallup speculates it's because we believe, as a society, that girls are more emotional, especially in the teen years, and that makes it hard to raise them. That's what Gallup is saying. All right, here's what I think, and I want to know what you think. I've got two girls, two daughters, 19 and 16. And I think it would be easier to raise boys only because of, for me, safety. What I'm worried about more than anything else raising my daughters is I'm afraid for their safety. My daughter just finished her first year in college. She's away from me, and I can't protect her. I worry about her traveling by herself. I worry about her going on dates. I worry about her walking the campus at night. I, I Those are the things that worry me and keep me up, up, up at night. And I know other fathers and mothers worry also about sex and pregnancy. Now, I'm not worried about that with my daughters because I, I, I just know my daughters well, and I'm not worried about that. And I go, well, Greg, you don't know. You're right. I don't know 100%. But I feel like her mother and I have raised them with the values that we care about, and I'm not worried that they're out there sleeping around. I, I'm not like Chris Rock, his old comedy routine where he said, you know, the job of the dad is just keep your daughter off the pole. I mean, if you can keep your daughter off the pole, then you've done what you need to do. That's a really low bar, isn't it? But I do think there are a lot of parents that are worried about safety, sex, and pregnancy for their daughters. And for the for a boy, they're like, eh, he'll be all right. Now, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's very smart. I think, you know, if your son gets a woman pregnant, it's just as big of a deal as if your daughter gets pregnant. If that was my son, I would make it that big of a deal for him. But I understand for a lot of people, they don't think that way. And I think... To me, that's why so many people say it's easier to raise boys than girls. The boy you can let run around outside. You don't worry about him getting hurt as much. As he gets older, you don't worry about him getting raped. You don't worry about him getting attacked as much as you do girls. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. What do you think? 844-DIG-CHAD, 844-DIG-CHAD. Did you see what Secretary of State Pompeo gave to Kim Jong-un on their meeting together in North Korea? Did you happen to see this? This blew me away. According to um, various news reports, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in North Korea today with a special gift for Kim Jong-un, a CD. And on that CD is Elton John's Rocket Man. Wait a second. I thought that was, that was a joke that Trump used to make fun of Kim Jong-un. And now they're actually giving it to him as a present? Yep. I called him Rocket Man, called him Little Rocket Man. It will see what happened was during Trump's meeting with Kim Jong Un during that summit last month, he asked him about it. Kim referred to his nickname of Rocket Man, and Trump said, Hey, have you ever heard Rocket Man? And Kim said, No. So Pompeo made, uh, got the CD to give to Kim. <laughs> I would love to know what Elton John would say about that. <laughs> So now he's got the song Rocket Man on the CD. All right. Hey, man, whatever it takes. And this is a great little piece here by Kitty Pavlich. You know how, how Trump was making fun of Elizabeth Warren being Pocahontas and she should take a DNA test and everything else? Well, Elizabeth Warren tweeted out, While you obsess over my genes, your administration is conducting DNA tests on little kids because you ripped them from their mamas and you're too incompetent to reunite them. Well, no, that's not the reason they're getting DNA tests. They're getting DNA tests to make sure that those people are really their parents 
because there is about a billion dollar smuggling operation that goes on to smuggle people into the United States and people claim to be the parents when they're not. At least tell the truth about that, Elizabeth. Hey, thanks for being with me. My name is Greg Knapp, in for Chad on the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show.